my question right now is about your support uh, for uh, the uh, U.S. treaty or the worldwide treaty on uh, nuclear weapons. Um, we know that uh, the administration has withdrawn their support from the South, who we thought was going to be their South Korean uh, ambassador nominee, Victor Cha, because mm -hmm. he would not uh, support a, uh, or indicated he could not support a first strike against North Korea. And the, uh, uh, what is it called, Nuclear Posture Review has, uh, contents has been leaked uh, showing that uh, the administration wants more money for what they call uh, smaller, more usable nuclear weapons. Well, th th thank you for the question. I think you heard President Trump as part of the State of the Union saying he wanted to build up our nuclear arsenal. I have to tell you, as I can see my Republican colleagues, there wasn't much of an applause on that side of the aisle for that either. Um, so th thank you for your comment. Thank uh, you. On the treaty, though, do you thank support you. that? I, I'm in the House. I don't get a vote on that. Oh, but you could still support it. Well, I talk to my senators. Oh, okay. see, if, see if Mitch McConnell brings it up. <laughs> Yes. Uh, good evening, uh, Congresswoman McCullough. I'm uh, Chris Knopp. I live in North Oaks, and I, um, on behalf of myself and canoeists and fishermen and sportsmen, I want to thank you for standing up for clean water and, and protecting the Boundary Waters Canoe Area against toxic sulfide. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Yes. I'm um, Dr. Ann Frisch from White Bear Lake. And I would like to know if you will vote to take away the power of the president to launch a nuclear war. There's a bill in the, in the House apparently right now. Uh, and I have a request uh, to help me get some information on the 23,000 liters of enriched nuclear fuel that was sent along superhighways in the East Coast to South Carolina when it could have been uh, Re, uh, reintegrated with uh, uranium uh, right in Canada, never having to cause dangers on the highway, potential accidents, and why are we uh, bringing nuclear enriched uranium into South Carolina? I, I suspect to build new, more new nuclear weapons, and they said it was for storage. But I'm very concerned about this practice being that my daughter lives in one of those cities that might have been on the route uh, in a truck that was never intended to carry liquid, highly enriched uranium. Thank you. Um, so the specifics, we'll, we'll get in more detail to you in, in general of what you're speaking to. You. I know uh, some, some about the way some of the nuclear waste. In, in Minnesota, for example, right here, Minnesota storing its own nuclear waste uh, from the uh, XL plant in, um, in Red Wing, right adjacent to the Prairie Island uh, Reservation. Um, so there's many places where it's currently being stored. There are compacts for removing uh, nuclear waste. Uh, some of it is medical waste. Um, I, don't, I don't know what kind of, if you're a physician or if you're, as, as I have some little friends who have a mother who has a PhD and she's a doctor of thinking. So, but um, in, in, in the hospitals here, we move a lot of um, medical uh, waste uh, that is uh, radioactive and we have compacts with other states and that's transported. I'll look into uh, whether or not things were um, in, in the uh, specific instance that you were talking about transported safely, but without knowing more of the details of when, how, and what was being transferred, it would be irresponsible of me to say anything more. So we will look into it. My staff is in the back and they'd be happy to get your name and, 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 and information on it and I will get back to you with Thank greater you. detail. Thank you. And can you support uh, taking away the power of the president to launch a nuclear war? Well, I'm very concerned um, when the uh, we, we've we've had many experts come in and talk to us about, about this and, and the checks and balances for doing this. Right now, if President Trump would give the go, um, the a nuclear weapon would be launched, and some of us have some concerns as to um, you know how that would be play out. Would he listen to his advisors if his advisors said no? Um, and, and how that works. So there are discussions, and there are bipartisan discussions taking 
taking place on that. But as far as a, a particular piece of legislation that's moving through, um, we need to make sure that whatever we do, um, part of the, the nuclear um, response is, uh, you know, it doesn't get into doing the first strike. Um, I don't think the president should have sole authority for that, for um, launching something back. I'm personally not, I, I, I don't think we should, I, think, I would like to see all nuclear weapons banned. So um, that would be my goal to denuclearize our country uh, first and foremost. Thank, Thank you. you. Hello. Hi, I'm uh, Bill from Woodbury. Hi. And first, thank you for having us meeting and for um, showing us all the work you've done and outlining a lot of the dangers. My feeling is though we get lost in the weeds a lot of times and I'm more concerned about the attacks on our basic principles of Americans from the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution that we, we kind of get lost in the weeds and we all as Americans should be looking at you mentioned demonizing of groups of people mm -hmm. based on where they're from, what their religion is, what color their skin is. This is happening, and that's indirect, you know, uh, against our, our, our uh, Declaration of Independence, that all people are created equal. And we forget that as, and we need more outrage when that gets, gets discussed by all Americans, not just Democrats and Republicans. The attack on freedom of speech. We hear an another basic tenet for all of us to protect that doesn't get the outrage when it gets attacked by the President of the United States. I could go on, I mean, but that to me is sometimes we get lost in the weeds of this, this kind of legislation or that legislation when we need more outrage to protecting our basic rights. Thank you. Is everybody speaking up? Thank you. Thank you. There have been a couple of people that have joined the line after I said the line was cut off, and so you kind of, I'm not going to look at anybody in particular, you know who you are. And I'm not gonna, um, yes, sir. Hello. I'll go fast. John from Lake Bear Lake. And I have a couple comments. One, uh, what can we people in this audience or anybody out here do? We feel kind of blown and helpless. I have a friend, a lifelong friend, who was a former United States Senator from Minnesota that I stay in contact with. And uh, I asked him, I said, why is there anybody in the Republican Party that will ever speak out against Trump and his behavior and so forth? He said, probably not. And I said, why is that? And he said, they're thinking about the election. Yeah, that could be. Um, I, I don't want to speak to other people's motives. I, I, I'm in the elevator with some of my colleagues coming back for a vote, and there'll be something that just broke in the news, and uh, that one of my Republican colleagues, I'll go, well, the, you know, did you hear what happened? And I went, yeah, that's just terrible. And I said, well, when are we going to say something together about it? And then it gets, then the conversation gets really quiet. Um, I, a former colleague of mine, Mike Rogers, who was the chair of the Intelligence Committee, and he's now doing intelligence work, Republican, um, he's been very forthful in speaking out. So have some of my other former Republican colleagues are speaking out. And I think maybe uh, some of the people that I'm serving with are either retiring or they see some of their other colleagues speak out. They'll feel that there's uh, more safety in, in numbers. But, but right now, I'm disappointed that I'm not seeing more of that, too. Thank you. Well, thank you for the move on the impeachment. I know it's a long road. And it needs to be a long, careful road. Thank you for doing that. Hello, uh, my name is Jerry, I'm from Stillwater. Um, I've been, um, I'm a Democrat. I um, have been disillusioned with the Democratic leadership in Congress because of the, uh, their haste in calling for Franken's resignation mm -hmm. and um, foregoing an ethics investigation. As a result, the allegations against them are just allegations. Um, I think we lost a great senator. He did a lot of good work for the state and for the Democratic Party. Um, so I, I guess I'd like to know if you could comment on your decision to call for his resignation. I didn't call, I did not call for his resignation ever. Um, I thought that was recorded in the Tribune. No. No, I didn't. 
I, like, any um, comment on the whole process? I'd be thing? happy to comment on that because um, Al and I, um, and you Al, a little bit before he became senator, we worked closely on a lot of, a lot of things together. And uh, when the news first came out about the inappropriate, um, and he called it inappropriate, you know, the photograph when he was on the USO tour, he said, you know, it was a soft, it was sophomore, it was something that he did before he was senator. And as um, we were, and I had talked to him about that, I said, yeah, not everything you do is funny. And he kind of, and he said, no, not everything I did was funny. But then the other allegations started coming forward. And I serve, right, with a lot of members, both in the House and the Senate, and the last thing a member ever says is, take me in front of the, the you know, the ethics committee. They usually quit. Yeah. Al said, take me to the ethics committee. And there needs to be due process. We're a nation of laws, and if we can't show due process within our chambers, how can we expect the public to count on us to provide due process for them? was very disappointed with the call of resignation and when I saw a pylon happen that day and um, I texted Al and Al texted back and I, went, I was at his farewell party and I look forward to continuing to work with him on some of the things and I'm not going to discuss what they are today, some of the things that we're going to continue to work on together. It was a very sad day and there should have been due process. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. I'm Sylvia from St. Paul, and uh, I also want to thank you for your work on human rights and, and the, the bill uh, that you, you introduced for uh, uh, Palestinian children. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask um, also, uh, you, you're in the minority, Democrats are in the minority, and I don't ever see that changing because of uh, gerrymandering, and disenfranchising of uh, Democrats or of people of color. And, uh, and even in Minnesota, we're about to, I, th I think we're gonna be losing a congressional seat. And if we've got, uh, if we've got a Republican uh, state legislature, it's likely to be one of yours or Keith's. Um, so can you comment on that? I can comment on gerrymandering. Um, I, because it's, I'm doing this officially, so I won't comment on campaign. But uh, gerrymandering is something that um, I find very, very alarming. I've been very supportive of uh, the system that they have in Iowa where they have an independent council draw up. There's, there's, there's been bills that have been discussed here at our state house to do that. We need to discuss it doing it nationally. The courts have stepped in both in Texas and in Carolina and recently in Pennsylvania saying enough is enough. What you're doing uh, to, for political gain is unconstitutional. Um, and because of some of the way um, the boundaries have been redrawn in, in Florida to be more fairly, the way the boundaries have, will be drawn more fairly in Pennsylvania, the way they have in Virginia and that, um, stay tuned to see what happens with the elections and I can say no more. My name is Alfred Wolfram. I live five blocks from here for the last 20 years. The preamble, of, uh, the Constitution is a preamble which most judges and politicians seem to ignore, and yet our founding fathers said it was the most critical part of our Constitution because it stated why we were having it. It has six articles. One of those articles is to provide for the, uh, provide for the general uh, welfare of the people of this country. And yet in this day and age, in this predated Trump, we see Bridges is disintegrating. Our national parks are going to hell. Uh, it goes on and on and on, including some of the things you say. And yet our Congress is more uh, uh, worried about supporting their parties on both sides of the aisle. I come here, I see a whole litany of how terrible the Republicans are. If I went to a uh, Republican uh, thing of this same sort, I'd hear how bad the Democrats are. When are our politicians going to start acting like Americans rather, and adults, rather than Republicans or Democrats? Even in the fundraising, last year at your own caucus, you were not at your caucus because you were in North Carolina raising funds for somebody down there. When are we going to start providing for the general welfare of our people? Thank you.
Well, I can't remember being in North Carolina. I won't be in caucuses on this coming Tuesday because I'll be at work. No, I, and I, I'm most sorry, of the other... I said North Carolina was New Mexico. New Mexico. Yeah, I'm sorry, I misspoke. It was New Mexico. Well, your, your point about um, my talking about Republicans today is, is, is you're right. And that's because they're controlling and setting the total agenda. Then we why would, not speak about the positive things that you want to do to provide for the general welfare of this I was, country? Sir, I was going to get to that. What I'd like to be, I'd like to be included. I'd like my party, the, the people who serve um, on my party, and I'm going to say party, to be included in tax discussions rather than locked out of the room. I would like to be included when we set, um, and this is getting into the weeds, but when we set the, the allocations that I had for uh, in the Interior Committee for the, for the Interior Bills, the Democrats would have liked to have at least been in the room rather than just said, here's the piece of paper, you either vote with us or you don't vote with us. You're right, there's too much of us going on. And that's why I mentioned earlier on, serving on a city council, when I served in the Minnesota House, Quite often, it wasn't by party, it was by region. If we needed to get a road built or we needed to get the, the bridge built in Hastings, we worked across the aisle to get things done together. And it, we've gotten into this constant election cycle. Well, we I think the one of the ways that we bust this up is to get rid of the gerrymandering so there's more swing seats. And the other thing we do is we get the big money out of politics. Yeah. Yeah. As having had a long life, card carrying Republican mother, I do not hate Republicans. Thank you. Tom? Hello, Betty. Tom from St. Paul. Uh, as a veteran, I, I wanted to come here to thank you for your advocacy for, on behalf of veterans. And particularly with this uh, administration, uh, it is very important to have people like yourself who will stand up against some of these just crazy ideas that have been pushed out by uh, 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 the administration. Just some people who aren't veterans, who aren't familiar with some of them, I'll mention two of them, that one of the proposals to the administration was to take the disability benefits away from totally disabled veterans when they reach retirement age, because they said, well, you can switch on to Social Security. Well, you can imagine if you're totally disabled how much money you've earned in your life on this job. Uh, another one of the proposals is women are becoming a, a larger and larger segment of the, uh, the veterans population because they're doing a wonderful job serving the country. Yes, we are. And one of the proposals is to move some of the care for women out of the VA so they don't have full services in the VA for their health care. It's just appalling, some of these proposals and how they will impact, negatively impact veterans. And I just want to thank you for being one of the ones who are standing up. Well, thank you. And Tim Wallace is doing a fabulous job working, and I will add, bipartisanly on that, on a lot of veterans' issues. But there is, there's been a lot of discussion about changing the way the VA works. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Earlene, and I'm from uh, Woodbury. And um, I, I didn't know about this meeting until last night. And I woke up and pulled it up on my email. And what the word that really caught my attention was chaos, that there's chaos going on. I grew up in Chicago, inner city projects under democratic rule. I was indoctrinated under that system and grew up hating Republicans until I became, as a late teenager, I started to read more and study more. And I asked my parents, do you even know a Republican? <laughs> do you know a white person? They didn't. So I started on my journey and I started to read history. And from history, I learned that in the 1800s, there were black people, black men in the Congress and people don't even know that. That's they right. have no clue. That's right. And you said something earlier about something being sensitive that you're really sensitive to. I don't because I could write. I got a, I got so many notebooks at home. You would not believe I could write a book. But I'll tell you.
from growing up in the city and living living the way we lived. My we were we were a full family. It was only three of us. I, I had a dad and he lived with us and my mother. I got one pair of shoes every year to start school. That's all I got. And so I was determined to get out of that poverty. And I believe, and I can tell you, I didn't get any help from the government. I worked my butt off, as well as my husband who graduated from Northwestern in, in, in Chicago. We worked until we got off. And so I've been involved in lots of voluntary things, trying to help people lift, go back, lift people up, especially my people, to bring them up to a point where they can take care of themselves and be self-thinking. Self when the uh, president gave his speech the other night, I was so happy to hear that the, uh, the African-American employment is the lowest ever reported in our country's history. And nobody, nobody really, really acknowledged that. And that hurts. What really hurt was the black caucus. If you're gonna disagree with anything, fine, but don't disagree with that. And the Hispanics as well. Their, their unemployment is low. Women's unemployment is low. So when I came here, to, when I saw that word chaos on the email, I thought to myself, uh-uh, this is, no. Where is, where is the, there are a lot of positive things happening. There are a lot of positive things happening in all communities. Unfortunately, we have a system that's divided. Republicans, Democrat, throw in some libertarians, throw in some independents. You got a system. We got what we got and we got to deal with it. But the way we deal with it is not by criticizing every single thing that our leaders do. Every single thing. I did not vote for Obama. I did not vote for him either time. Ma'am, I, I don't mean to be rude or just I know, I'm just going to speak down at 8 o'clock. Fine, I'm fine, fine. I will finish. And Thank the reason you. I did not vote for him was because I paid more attention to what he was saying. So I'm asking you, pay attention to what this man is saying. You don't have to love him. You can hate him all you want. But look at what he's doing for the black communities. And that word immigrant is not, it's not immigrant, it's called illegal immigrant. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. She, she's entitled to her opinion. And, this, and the Congressional Black Caucus looked at a different set of facts. And I, I agree with uh, the position that they took of uh, uh, President Obama lifting this um, up out of the Great Recession, and um, it was a lot of the hard blood, sweat, and tears work that he did that uh, gave uh, President Trump the ability to, to build on a, on a foundation. Sir? Good evening. Uh, my name is Jacob Hunt, and I'm from Maplewood. Uh, so for the past year and a half, I've been volunteering with the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. Good for you. And so to start off, we'd like to thank you for your support for cancer patients and survivors. Um, to kind of further, to kind of lead into my question here, uh, we're hoping as the, the Cancer Society as a whole to see a $2 billion increase in funding for the National Institutes of Health uh, for the upcoming budget year. So my question for you is, as you guys are coming to budget agreements, uh, which is an ongoing process, uh, are, do you plan on seeing any increase in federal, federal medical research funding as you guys come to agreements? We're going to give it our best shot, but this tax bill created such a huge deficit that we're very, very concerned about being able to make the investments we wanted to. And as I pointed out, in President Trump's budget that he sends to us, he uh, you know, cuts uh, funding for the NIH, the CDC, and other research causes. So we're, we're going to work very hard to do what we can for that, because that, that's important, especially also research not only to cancer, but in Alzheimer's. Thank you. Thank you. Um, please. Hi. Uh, my name is Tim O'Neill. I'm from the Highland Park neighborhood of St. Paul. Uh, I just kind of an overarching thing. I've, I've just noticed so many stories recently. I, uh, I don't know how many of you guys 
are on Reddit and go to the politics subreddit, but it's just like a deluge of stories every day on what is going on, whether it's Stormy McDaniels or uh, McCabe leaving or the Nunez, uh, the Nunez secret memo. Uh, one that passed by though was Trump decides, I'm looking at a headline here, Trump decides not to enact Russian sanctions. Sanctions that, uh, this was voted 419 to three by the House, 98 to two by the Senate. It was signed by President Trump. Now he's not enforcing it. Uh, it just seems like a constitutional crisis, almost impeachable by itself. So I'm wondering what the pushback will be from Congress going against this. Well, uh, we were very alarmed. Uh, it was being discussed as, as I was leaving Washington, and it will be discussed again when we get back. That was a bipartisan um, um, vote, huge vote. In fact, it would have been a vote that was a sustained veto override had this been a bill that the president would have vetoed and overridden, but instead he's just not going to move forward with that part of the bill with the sanctions. We're very alarmed by that. Russia interfered in our election. They're interfering in, in democracies all over. I was in uh, Germany meeting with some of the parliamentarians and the foreign minister. I, I was with the, in the EU last year. They're alarmed about what's going on. And for us to just uh, look like, uh, especially uh, the leader of the free world, the president of the United States, to say, oh, you know, I talked to Putin, you know, you really didn't mean it or whatever, is unconscionable. And I believe uh, it goes to the heart of why, uh, one of the reasons why I think we need to implement a full investigation with subpoenas and full transparency about what is going on, what meetings did take place, and what kind of contracts have been signed between the President and the Congresswoman uh, McCollum, I'm Peter Fleming from Woodbury. I want to make a couple of comments relative to the copper nickel mining issue around the uh, boundary waters. The science is very clear on the toxicity that can result from copper nickel mining. It's been proven worldwide. This is the absolute wrong place to do that type of mining. And I want to thank you very much for your uh, pro-environmental stands on it, the bill that you worked on a year or so ago, and I hope going forward we can count on you to, to work hard to save the boundary waters from the threat of copper nickel mining. So I'd ask you if you could make a comment or two as to what you will be able to do to, to help this situation. Thank you. Well, one of the things that I thought we had accomplished because I heard from you on how important this, this national treasure is and from people all, over, all around the United States, was we had report language in, in the U.S. Forest Service. Governor Dayton withdrew uh, leases around, state leases around the BWCA, and the Forest Service suspended um, renewing releases in that area for a two-year study to be conducted to find out, is it even possible Every single one of these mines have leaked, but is it even possible to really do the due diligence? Because once this water is damaged and the plants are damaged and the animals are gone, you know, we're lucky if 500 years something kind of comes back. That's how bad it, yeah, it is. So, what we, so we had the study and um, we had people within our, um, you know, Tom ever had a bill on the floor. Uh, to uh, you know, to allow the mining to go forward, and I had assurances in committee for both um, Secretary Zinke of Interior and Secretary Purdue of Agriculture that they would let the study go through, and then uh, Zinke backdoored uh, backdoored us on it. I'm not giving up. This is too important of a, of a fight, not only for this generation, for the next generation to protect this unique area, but more importantly, to protect all that water for future generations. So keep the pressure up and keep writing the letters. And if you know people in other states, have them reach out to uh, their representatives about saving the BWCA. Thank you. Thank you for your efforts. Congressman McCollum, I'm Scott Frampton from Woodbury, Minnesota, and along with my colleague, uh, we are colleague uh, Veronica Mar Martinez. Uh, we are employees of a small business uh, in, in your in your district and in constituents uh, of, of of your district. And I, I actually was in your office yesterday in Washington, hoping to speak to you about. Darn it! And I was on an airplane coming home. Yes, so here we are. Absolutely, <laughs> we, we just missed you. And, and so here we are today. Uh, Veronica and I, uh, our, our jobs really depend on this cap relief. 
Uh, it's very, very important to our small business. Um, we are in the process of trying to hire 20 American workers at the uh, minimum hourly rate of 16, 13 an hour and are able to pay as much as $26 an hour depending upon their qualifications. We're having a very difficult time finding those American workers to fill, fulfill those positions. And I'd also like to add in, you know, my colleague Veronica, she is an immigrant to this country. My wife is an immigrant to this country and we realize immigrants are very important. We don't necessarily see the temporary visa as an immigration issue and it's been lumped in with DACA and everything else. We even have a DACA employee in our, in our company and we have friends and colleagues that, are, that have DACA children. So we're very familiar with these immigration issues. We do not see the temporary visa as a immigration issue, although it's been lumped in with that. And we just really, really would like you to work with your Democrat colleagues and, and, and your friends across the aisle to, to help us with cap relief. Well, thank you. And we'll follow up. You left your information at the, at the desk in DC. I, I, we left the information at the desk. We, we talked to one uh, gentleman, uh, one of your staff. Okay. Out in the hall I'll follow up too and let you know what, if there's any moving on it. Fantastic. If thank you both for coming. In those positions, I've got some information right here. <laughs> All right. All right. We got a lot of access. Oh, uh, my name is Matt, and I'm from Vadis Heights. Um, it sounds like immigration is the next issue that Congress is going to take up. And I, first of all, wanted to say that back in 2013, a bill that would have provided a pathway to citizenship for 11 million undocumented immigrants and would have provided $30 billion for border security passed the Senate with 68 votes, and John Boehner wouldn't allow it to uh, be voted on in the House floor. So they are doing something about it. Um, I was wondering what an ideal immigration compromise would look like to you. Um, would it be a narrow one that just specifically focused on protecting the dreamers? Or would you be willing to um, work with the administration with what they've proposed with cuts to legal immigration? Well, for, first and foremost, the, the people who are here under the Deferred Action Program that are about to face deportation on March 5th, that has to be addressed immediately, swiftly, and by itself. And then we need to work on some comprehensive immigration reform. A follow-up there, would you be um, open to a government shutdown for the Dreamers, or do you believe that's an irresponsible way to govern? Well, first we need a budget number so we can even uh, have conversations, and we don't have that. And I really believe the Dreamers have been held hostage as the excuse why the Republicans in the House and the Senate and the White House haven't come up with a budget number. And that's because they know after they pass the tax bill, there's no money to do what the gentleman was talking about for NIH, cancer research, our national parks, and our veterans. So that's, so let's not hide behind the dreamers on that. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. From St. Paul, and uh, I'm a federal employee, and so I was wondering what it's looking like in Washington right now as far as whether there will be another continuing resolution on February 8th, or whether you think there's the, the possibility of a shutdown is uh, pretty real. There's no need to have a shutdown. If, if the, the Republicans who control the House and the Senate and uh, the White House can agree on a number, the Appropriations Con Conference Committee, we can come together, we can do our job, we can fund the government, and then we can start working on the, on the next, next resolution. There is no excuse not to come up with a number unless it's a number that they know the American people are gonna rebel against. Uh, there's just no, no excuse for having, having a government shutdown. But I will not, I will not continue to be an enabler of them not getting their job done. And, you know, uh, it's, it's just morally wrong that we don't stay and get our work done. Be, when, they, when they announced uh, the, the last budget shutdown and that we would have our, we would, you know, come back into session, you know, by February 8th and pass a budget bill, the House was only in session two full days when they said that. So I didn't vote for that because that was lying to the American people about how serious the leadership in both the House and the Senate were about getting their work done. We need to stay, we need to get our work done, but they have to give us a number to get our work done. And so um, I just wanna uh, say, especially for, it's not just 
um, federal employees, it's, it's, it affects state employees, it affects county employees, it, it affects people, nonprofits, and that when we don't have our work done and when there's a government shutdown. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to thank thank you for your service, ma'am, uh, to our country because federal employees can usually make a lot more money in the private sector, but they, they do it because they, they love their country. Yes, sir. My name's Lincoln Fetcher. I live uh, just a few blocks in uh, North St. Paul, up by the lake. Um, I have, I just have a simple question about whether or not there's any impact of all of the online petitioning and messaging. This is, you know, uh, that, that's that, that's a that's a good that's a good question. Um, because how do you, how do you communicate effectively now? And that's what it comes down to because you want to make sure your voice is heard. So our office gets online petitions. Um, we look, we, we try to, we hope that people fill everything out so we know whether that, that our constituent and that I, that I represent them. We get quite a few of them. Um, sometimes we can't read the email um, well enough to respond. We try to respond to those that, that we can decode and, and read. I think, I think it's an effective tool and it's a tool that you want to use, uh, I would use it. One of the things that I found very disturbing, however, when we were talking about um, I'll use the Bears Ears National Monument, which Zinke rescinded. Um, his comment was, well, you know, yeah, we heard from all the interest groups. And we said, well, what do you mean? Well, all those online petition groups we got from the environmentalists, and yeah, we, we got those, so those don't count. But he met with the oil and gas and mining industries. I mean, so you're, in my opinion, your petition counts. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mickey, I'm from New Brighton. Uh, two years ago, I was part of a delegation that went to uh, the state of Oaxaca in southern Mexico, and we spoke with NGOs and farmers um, about immigration, trade, and agriculture. And by far the number one issue for them was NAFTA. Um, just the horrible devastation that it has wrought in their communities. And what struck me was no one asked, or was asking us to make it easier for them to immigrate to the US. Everyone was asking us to help them make it easier for them to stay home. They're, they're only coming here because they're being forced to, you know by economic policies that are sometimes imposed at gunpoint. And NAFTA is the biggest part of that. So I would um, strongly encourage you, if you get the chance, hopefully you will, to don't even bother renegotiating NAFTA, just repeal it. That would be by far the best option. And one of the few good things that Trump has done um, was killing the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, of course, all he had to do for that was to get elected. Um, and I would also say um, that a job I had, I worked in downtown Minneapolis for a large financial company, and they br brought in a lot of uh, people from India to work there. And that really upset me, frankly because I thought they were just um, trying to save money, basically, by not giving those jobs to Americans, which there, I think there are plenty of qualified, unemployed people just in the Twin Cities, and certainly around the country. And I don't resent the Indians at all for taking those jobs, because I know they have it worse than we do. Um, but I just want, you know, I want, the political leadership in this country to realize that, you know, people are coming here because we're destroying their livelihoods through these free trade agreements and other economic policies. And the refugees are mostly created by wars that we are either participating in or funding or supporting in some way, or because of dictators we're supporting. So. Those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing. And, I, and the Iraq War did create a lot of, 
of refugees in, in Iraq that have, that have come here and a lot of, uh, a lot of turmoil in, in the Middle East and what we're seeing in Syria. So um, our, our urgency uh, by the Bush administration to go in Iraq has caused a lot of, a lot of uh, hurt for a lot of families all over the world. Thank you for your comments, sir. Yes, my name is Mark Bradley. And uh, the Bradleys have uh, been in Minnesota since it's been a territory. So I've been here for quite a while. In fact, uh, my grand grandfather uh, was uh, the one who aided in uh, uh, setting up uh, the Pioneer Press when I was here, which is our oldest paper. Now, I have three issues I'd like you to uh, uh, address when you have a chance to. The I could one... probably only get to one now because we okay. have to be out of here by 8.30 and I want to be fair to everybody. Right. Well, so, what I was, trying to, I was just going to quickly gloss right through them, but the most important one that I was looking at was the fact that uh, we talk about Homeland Security, and uh, I think that we've forgotten the most important part of Homeland Security is not what we're doing offshore, which we have uh, over a quarter million people that are permanently stationed in the whole world, and another uh, about a quarter of a million that are floating on the oceans. Instead, what we should be looking at is our own protection of our own shores, which is the Coast Guard. We have one cutter that's supposed to be opening up the Great Lakes during the spring, and the rest of the time it's being used in other areas when it can be used, and it's been being refitted for the last 25 years. We used to have two, but the other one's so badly damaged, they can't even use it anymore. We have not outf outfitted our own people, and yet these are the people that are going to be stationed in our country, which would actually be bringing more financing to the shores and every place else, even up into Canada on the borders up here in Minnesota. We have uh, security up here that we should actually probably expand. My issue is uh, the fact is uh, that we have also had corporations that brought a lot of the, the issues that we always blame on the Hispanics. I lost my job, but not because of that, because my union would not support me to stay in there because they were supporting their uh, craft people rather than the local union itself. That uh, A lot of people lost their jobs from 3M at that point. I'm not trying to be uh, at all, uh, uh, I'm trying to be actionable, saying what we can do rather than uh, blame it on anybody, saying there is things that we should be addressing. And these are things I think we should look at. How much have we wasted our money on a $2 billion uh, uh, airline carrier that will be blasted out of the, the, the waters in the first three months, uh, three days probably, of a war. And yet we don't take care of uh, the units that are on our coast that are uh, taking the people that are disenfranchised that are floating in here because we won't buy the equipment for them. I would rather see us putting more money into the Coast Guard and what they're doing and taking care of our people here. The other one was just 55. We should build that. It would help save all. Thank you. Thank you. And I've been working on getting more um, ice, ice cutters up, up in Alaska. We don't, we, we really only have one functional ice cutter. Um, and uh, Russia uh, is uh, building them as we speak. And uh, we need to, uh, we need to invest uh, in, in, in ice cutters for our national security. So that uh, Alaska, which you can see Russia from Alaska, you really can. Uh, there, uh, we, we, we need we need to we need to make sure we have ice cutters there. So, uh, Hi, Betty. I'm Linda from St. Paul, and um, since 2016, I've been involved in four groups: Indivisible, the Women's March, Move On, and Our Revolution. And in most of those groups, people are really, really interested in single payer Medicare for all and getting money out of politics. So how do we make those two things happen? Yes, please tell us. <laughs> well, <laughs> right now, we'll, we'll, we'll be here all night. And that, Linda, I think because of the groups that you said you're with, I need to meet you at my campaign office rather than discuss it here. <laughs> we'll have coffee. <laughs> I'm serious about that, but that, that's that's a little too too political. You've been waiting very patiently, sir. Thank you, uh, Betty. Thank you very much for uh, uh, allowing us to come here for this town hall. It's the first time I've ever been. My name is Jim Brunzel. I'm from Van the Sites. And two things I'd like to say is, uh, first of all, I'd like to see the Democrats in the House uh, hold the Republicans uh, their feet to the fire. 
especially uh, uh, Devin Nunes. I mean, you cannot kill the Republicans with kindness because they'll run all over you. And that's, that's one thing I'd like to say. And another thing I'd like to say is, on a lighter note, um, what's your stance on legalizing marijuana in Minnesota? <laughs> well, that's a state decision. Peter Fisher's sitting right down here with Senator Weaver. You can talk to the two of them. Uh, one of the things that I've been working on with a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, folks across the aisle, in fact, is uh, stopping RVA from being gagged, especially in states like Minnesota where there's medical marijuana available and other states where there's marijuana available. Right now, if a, um, a person from the VA went in and even wanted to have a discussion about medicines that they were taking and what might be the effect of using uh, marijuana with it, um, the VA doctor can't discuss it. And that's wrong. And uh, I believe we should be doing some federal research in, into the efficacy and how marijuana uh, works uh, because people are using it at, as a medicine. And I think some of the work that's been done here in Minnesota and some of the other states could be used right away by, um, by the federal government to do research. And I think the VA should be doing research in it too because it seems to have a lot of promise for post-traumatic stress. And so, um, um, if you talk to these two guys about legalizing here at the state, we have my full commitment to make sure that we do the research uh, on medical marijuana and that we remove a gag, especially for VA doctors in states where it's legal. Hi, Betty. Doug Carlson, St. Paul. Um, I just wanted to examine the phrase which was uh, praised in Trump's speech uh, the other night, America, Americans are dreamers too. If you examine it, it's, it's a rearrangement of presumably the phrase dreamers want to be Americans or something like that. It reminded me of the Black Lives Matter um, movement when after that began, I saw a bumper sticker that said Blue Lives Matter, and then I saw a neighbor <coughs> sign that said All Lives Matter, and to me, these things are givens that Americans are dreamers, uh, Blue Lives Matter and All Lives Matter, but to usurp those words, uh, to deflect from the real issue, uh, it seems to me to be the wrong way to go. So I object not to the phrase America, Americans are dreamers too, but to the, uh, the, the um, motives behind it. Uh, it suggests that there's, we're in a limited good or so some kind of game here where if uh, one group, group A is deprived of dreams, then um, group B will get more and vice versa. That's my only comment. Thanks. There was an audible gasp when he said that. <laughs> I, a lot of people were saying, isn't that from Black Lives Matter? I mean, they, they were, so people, people have picked up on that. Um, and I'll share with my seatmates during the State of the Unions that I had people listening very careful to the president here in the 4th District. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your patience. Last question. You can wave me off if you want, because I came up after you cut off. I know. I know you did. You kind of stood out there in that bold North plaid shirt there, you know. <laughs> Norwegian. <laughs> yeah, you are so glad. Well, um, yeah, I wanted to comment that, and ask a question to him. Um, yeah, I'm thankful that am I talking too close to this thing or what's is it my voice? Adam says you get closer to it, you're Okay, does this help? He's just Sorry. too tall for the mic. Can't you raise it from the no I'm teasing now? Um yes, I'm thankful that um a good thing going on in government is now the HHS um, has recognized unborn babies as human beings. And um, I think that's a step in the right direction. And recently there was a vote on being capable mm -hmm. um, unborn babies. And unfortunately that didn't pass despite science recognizing that uh, babies at 20 weeks or older 
will um, experience extreme pain in an abortion. And um, my question would be, do you see the day coming when unborn babies will finally be recognized as human beings um, and valued as soul and be included and have find equality and uh, inclusiveness? Um, that was my main question. Thank you. So, here's my goal. My goal is to work so that every pregnancy is celebrated as a joyful moment. Every pregnancy. So, I'm going to work on making sure that contraception is available. I'm also going to work, and I, I'm, I'm working with uh, with, with a mother right now who almost lost a, a child, um, born early, um, because they didn't detect what was going on with uh, blood pressure and, and, and blood movement. And Anna Marie, in talking to doctors, this, this is a woman who lives here in, in the 4th District of Minnesota. You know, have you ever been to the hospital where they put the little thing on your finger and they can tell how you're doing? Anna Marie, as a single movement, has made that start to happen for babies in hospitals, and doctors are catching things early. So there's amazing things we can do in NICUs, and there's amazing things that, that we can we can do for, do for research. And um, I want to thank you for sharing your view on that. Um, and uh, I wish you all the best in staying warm in that great-looking plaid shirt. So I want to thank everybody for being here. Once again, I want to say I'm so proud to be your representative, and I get to go back home and brag about how wonderful this town hall was. Thank you all for being here.